Hello, Medley20 here with another episode of Art Talk. Today we're going to discuss the topic of lighting and shading. Now, for all you beginner artists out there, this might be somewhat intimidating, but it's never a bad idea to get a good grasp of how light logic works. This video will probably be more geared towards intermediate artists who are comfortable with things like line, shape, and color, but struggle in terms of getting light and shadow shapes correct. Okay, so first off, why is shading even important? Cartoons get away with using flat colors all the time anyway, right? Well, there's your problem in the name right there. Flat colors often result in flat pictures. Lighting and shading really help in terms of making your drawings look solid, tangible, and believable. People have a tendency to write off value and shading as less important than color, but really it's the other way around. As long as your values or relative lightness and darkness are believable, then you can slap on any colors you want willy-nilly and chances are you'll still have a solid drawing. On the other hand, if your colors are good but you still have poor values, then your drawing will tend to suffer. So how do you figure out where to place your shadows? Well first, you'll want to establish your light source. Is it a light source originating from a single point in space, or is it a global light source? Depending on how close your light source is from your subject, you should expect your light to cast shadows in different patterns. Light sources that are close to your subject will throw shadows in a wider range of directions than the light sources that are farther away. Now a good way to help you visualize where your light and shadow shapes fall is to imagine your subject is covered in black, ashy soot. Now imagine your light source is exploding with magical water that doesn't react to gravity. Anywhere your subject gets wet is where your light shapes will be, and anywhere that stays dry is where your shadow shapes will be located. If it's a relatively weak light source, the magical water slash light slash whatever won't travel quite so far. So areas that are farther away from your light source will remain relatively dry with maybe a little bit of residual moisture making its way to the farther reaches of your subject. On the other hand, if it's a strong light source, your subject will be lit fairly consistently regardless of the distance from the light. Okay, so let's look at the anatomy side of light and shading. Basically, we've got the light side and the dark side. That's it. We ain't got no Anakin Skywalker crossing over to the dark side to become Darth Vader, unless you count reflected lights, but we'll get into that. Okay, so this thing here is a highlight. It'll probably be the brightest spot on your subject. It is important as hell not to overdo it with the highlights, otherwise your subject will look way too glossy or overexposed. Tone it down and let your midtones speak for themselves. If your subject is glossy, your highlights will have high contrast and sharp edges. If your subject is matte, then your highlights will have much lower contrast and soft edges. Unless you've got a sharp corner. Keep your sharp corners sharp, kids. Now, John Clapp will probably disapprove of this area being called the midtones, since it's a bit of a misnomer. It's still on the light side of your subject, and there's very little middle ground when it comes to light and shadow. Your subject is either in light, or it isn't. Either way, it's still darker than the highlight, and it's lighter than anything in the shadow side, so I figured... Anyway, now come the shadows. This bit right here that's on the subject itself is called the form shadow. This is caused by the form of your subject wrapping around itself so that light can't reach the back end. Uh, unless there's another light back there too, but we'll, we'll just assume that we have a single light source for now. The form shadow is made up of two basic components, the core shadow and the reflected light. The core shadow is fairly simple, it's the darkest part of your shadow where very little light, either from your main light source or from your reflected light, reaches. Reflected light is a bit trickier though. Now, have you ever washed some dishes, then do the thing where you hold a spoon under the running faucet and it splashes all over you even though you weren't in the direct path of the faucet? Well, that happens with light too. It's called reflected light. Reflected light occurs when light from your light source bounces off a surface behind your subject and shines just a tiny bit of light back on your subject. Now, there are a few things to keep in mind about reflected light. Number one. Reflected light will always be less luminous than your main light source. This is one of the biggest pitfalls for people who are just starting to get into doing reflected light. It's really easy to overdo them, which tends to blow out your shadow shapes and flattens out your drawing. Sometimes artists will exaggerate their reflected lights as a stylistic choice, but try to avoid jumping straight into stylizing your work. It's best to learn the rules of real life before you start exaggerating them. A good way to avoid doing this is to first block in your shadow shapes, then instead of making the reflected lights lighter, try to make your surrounding shadows darker. Number two. Reflected light is not the same thing as rim lights. Rim lights are a secondary light source that originates from somewhere behind your subject, so the areas on your subject that are illuminated by the rim light are getting direct exposure from a secondary light source. Number three, reflected light will often carry color. So if your main light source is bouncing off a red surface to reflect on your subject, then the reflected light on your subject will also be red. Now that we've got the form shadow out of the way, let's move on to the cast shadow. The cast shadow is formed by your subject blocking light from being cast on another object behind it. It's the same kind of shadow that you use to cast shadow puppets. Determining the placement of a cast shadow can be tricky work, and I'll cover it in another video, but for now let's just get a rough estimate based on the angle of the light. 
The main body of the cast shadow will be similar to the shape of your subject, and it also has what's called an occlusion shadow. An occlusion shadow is the darkest area in a cast shadow located roughly where your subject meets the surface it's resting on. It's caused by teeny tiny gaps where light just cannot reach, so it will typically be the darkest area of your piece in general. Now that we've learned the anatomy of light and shadow shapes, we can move on to edge quality. Edge quality refers to the hardness and softness of the edge of a shadow shape. Proper use of edge quality can really boost the solidity and believability of your piece, yet it is often overlooked by developing artists. Now, you'd think that edge quality would be complex as fuck given how important it is, but it really boils down to a few things. Number 1. Form shadows will have soft edges. The bigger and rounder the form, the softer the edge. Number 2. Cast shadows will have hard edges. They'll be crisper and sharper when the cast shadow is close to your subject, and as the cast shadow drifts away from your subject, the edge quality will become fuzzy. And that's about it. No fancy anatomical breakdowns, no memorization of complex formulas pertaining to light physics. It's just soft form shadows and hard cast shadows. Look how easy that is! Whoa! And check out the difference it makes when you actually pay attention to edge quality. It's insane! We're now coming up to the end of the video, so we'll just wrap it up with a few key do's and don'ts of light and shadow shapes. Do simplify your shadow shapes. Break down light and dark into just two big basic values, then you can refine your edges and add reflected lights later. Don't try to do everything all at once. You'll overcomplicate your values, which will make your piece look too busy and flatten things out. Do treat your whole subject as a single unit. Don't treat each part of your subject as its own separate component. It'll look really weird and artificial if you break things up into arms and legs and fingers and toes. Do experiment with using various colors in your light and shadow shapes. Don't shade with just BLOCK and white. This is the fastest way to kill all the life out of your colors. Do use reference. Don't try to draw realistically from your head. Unless you've already had years of experience drawing from observation, you'll just end up with a creepy, uncanny valley kind of look. And even if you do have lots of experience, like, it's really easy to mess things up. Do be bold with your shadow shapes. It's easier to overdo the shadows than bring it back to a more reasonable level than it is to timidly keep adding more and more until you get something that looks roughly right. Don't shade like this. Seriously, it just looks like a flat, embossed, puffy sticker or something. Do actually draw or paint your light and shadow shapes manually with, with colors. Don't rely on the dodge and burn tool. It's called the burn tool for a reason. It fucking burns your eyes out of their sockets. So to recap, Light is water, shadows can be broken down into parts, edge quality is important, and all them do's and don'ts. Anyway, that's about it for today. Thanks for watching! Sorry I haven't been posting much of these lately. I've just gotten out of school, so hopefully I'll have some time this summer to actually put out some content. If you want to see me work on paintings like this in real time, feel free to follow me on Twitch. I occasionally stream art, and we can hang out and chat while I do it. Be sure to be good to yourself and to others, and remember that I love you guys. See you later! Block.